question. So thank you, thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to the Excellence of Black Philanthropy. My name is Ilyasa N. Shabazz and I'm the Senior Manager of Marketing and Community at Philanthropy Together. We are a global initiative to grow and strengthen the collective giving movement through programming like We Give Summit. We, we thank you all for joining us and sharing this space with one another and with our amazing group of panelists. To our wonderful speakers, we're so grateful to have you here leading today's conversation on Black philanthropy. And to the audience, we ask that you engage in this discussion, use the chat, ask questions, share your reactions. We, we really wanna get the chat going. Um, so please be sure uh, and share in there. If you haven't already, tell us what you're grateful for today as we kick this conversation off. And also, if you're live tweeting or sharing on your social stories, please be sure that you're using hashtag WeGiveSummit. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to today's moderator, Kia Jarman, with Give Black, Give Back and the Black Philanthropy Initiative to kick off uh, today's discussion. Welcome, Kia. Thank you so much, Ilyasa, for that wonderful introduction. I love hearing um, that uh, intro from Ed. Um, that was wonderful. I'm grateful to be here serving as your moderator for today. And while I wear many hats, I am here in the capacity of Black Philanthropy Initiative. And that's birthed out of my desire to share and amplify the stories and history that celebrate Black philanthropy. That passion has led me to co-launch and co-chair Give Black, Give Back, a philanthropic initiative here in Middle Tennessee in collaboration with our Community Foundation, where we provide support to the 40 plus Black-led funds and endowments at the foundation. We provide resources to Black-led nonprofits, and we educate the community about the racial wealth gap. Today's panel, The Excellence of Black Philanthropy, is inspired by the history of philanthropy tied to our ancestral presence of Black people giving long before chattel slavery in this country. The present moment and how we've been constant innovators of how to support our communities and the future that is filled with an energy of resilience. As you can tell, the spirit of giving and sowing is prevalent in our DNA. And the data reflects that point. In a joint report by the Kellogg Foundation and Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, it shares that Black households donate $11 billion with a B. I always have to emphasize that annually to community-based organizations and causes. And that is just what's trackable. We have certainly seen that during the pandemic, particularly. So today's panelists are premier leaders. They are people I look up to in this work, um, not only in the conversation, so they're not just talking about Black excellence and philanthropy, but they have also been directly guiding initiatives that model and impact how funds are used to stabilize and enhance the Black community. I'm going to introduce briefly our guests, but I encourage you to, to go to the website, wegivesummit.org, and look under speakers and find out more about them, because I'd be talking the whole hour if I had to share their entire bio. Let me start with Terry Love with Community Investment Network. He is the Senior Principal and Director of Change Management at CI Consultants, and he is the Chairman of the Board of Directors for the Community Inve Investment Network. He provides a wealth of knowledge and experience in the philanthropic sector by bringing together or bringing forth work um, to implement models of collective giving circles as an effort to engage more donors of color. Next is Dr. Jackie Copeland. I'm a fan of her. She is the founder of Black Philanthropy Month, which we're all gearing up for. I hope that you're on the line. You are gearing up for your August event. She's a social and environmental justice leader and founder and president and CEO of the Women Invested to Save Earth Fund, an innovation enterprise supporting grassroots Black and Indigenous women, climate change innovators in Africa, Brazil, Australia, and the U.S. And next we have Edward Jones of the Association of Black Foundation Executives, or ABFE, I believe I'm saying that correctly. Edward Jones is the Vice President of Programs. And in his role, he leads philanthropic professional development and convening activities, as well as supports the design and implementation of the organization's racial justice and equity program for more than 900 members and partners across the globe. And I believe this is their 50th year. He put something in the chat about that. So I hope you visit his website to learn more about that. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Tyrone Freeman, an award-winning writer, speaker, and teacher whose work examines the intersections of philanthropy, activism, and race in America. A nationally recognized expert in African-American philanthropy, he writes and speaks about the various forms of Black generosity and social change, past and present. He's currently the Assistant Professor of Philanthropic Studies at Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis. 
He is also the author, if you cannot tell, of the Madam C.J. Walker's Gospel of Giving that he has in the background, Black Women's Philanthropy During Jim Crow, which examines African-American women's history on charitable giving, activism, education, and social service through the life and example of Madam C.J. Walker. See, I told you, a whole mouthful, and we're just getting started. Um, but these wonderful panelists are with us today. Thank you so much. My first question as a storyteller is I want to know the origin of your individual philanthropy story and, of course, how that ties into the importance of philanthropy within our community. Um, so, Dr. Uh, Copeland, I'll start with you, um, and then we'll go from there. Everybody feel free to jump in whenever. Uh-oh, I think you're muted. It wouldn't be a Zoom meeting if we hadn't said it once, right? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. But I'm just, I just wanted to say I'm really happy to be here with everyone, the fellow panelists as well. And, um, now, you know, just for this moment to get together and talk about how to make our giving more powerful. So like a lot of people, I uh, grew up in the church family that gave, our motto was give to it, give until it hurts. We took that a little too far sometimes, but that was what it was all about. Um, and I remember uh, wanting to go to college and being worried about how I was going to pay for it. And a older cousin said to me, you know, if you keep getting good grades, strangers will give you money to go to college. And I said, huh, what is that? And that's how I learned about scholarships. That was my introduction to formal philanthropy, institutional philanthropy. And I said, bet, I'll get my A's and now I want to go get this free money and it worked. So um, I, like a lot of folks, fell into the world of institutional philanthropy, but I always remember no matter what my day job is that I come from a rich tradition of philanthropy that um, is based on my African heritage through my family's Geechee background in the Charleston, South Carolina area, transplanted to Philly, and that is the engine of social change and progress in the U.S. and the world. So that's just, that's a story in a, in a nutshell. I've been working on funding equity using um, pooling time, talent, treasure, and voice by any means necessary um, for our community and the world for about 40 years now. Thank you for that, Dr. Copeland. Um, Edward, will you unmute yourself and introduce your origin story? Thank you for reminding me as far as I started talking. Uh, <laughs> it's a wonderful pleasure to be here with you all. And um, wow, I, I appreciate how you framed that, Jackie. I, I, I grew up not knowing the word philanthropy, but I grew up in a, with a family that we we did give and share. And although I was an only child, I really wasn't a selfish child. I was a, I was a baby, uh, I had older brothers and sisters. So I was always on the receiving end of, of the kindness of the family and um, learned really about the idea of uh, other engagement with respect to charitable work through my fraternity. When I joined college, um, we did stuff in high school, but when I joined Phi Beta Sigma fraternity and living in the notion of culture for service and service for humanity, uh, even when you know I was in some of my brokest days in college, we could find canned food to give away and other things to, to be um, you know to, to contribute and give back to others that had even less. Uh, and then uh, by accident, you know, after working professionally in, in other spaces, when I relocated to Washington D.C. Um, after 9/11 and getting laid off a job that I hated anyway, which so it was a blessing, uh, there was uh, a friend who told me of a temporary position that had come available by accident because someone had an accident at a conference and it was uh, a person that worked at Council on Foundations. And so I went there thinking it was gonna be a temporary gig. It ended up being 12 years and four days of work. Um, 12 days, 12 years of understanding this thing we call philanthropy and understanding then even the most significant part of that for me, which was as I learned to navigate the, the good and the bad of the work in the field itself, I also realized that if I was gonna work in a space, I want to work for an organization like AbbVie, not anticipating that that would be the, where I have been now for seven years, but uh, as opportunities arose, that was an opportunity for me. And, and even through that, and my own you know, donations throughout church and other spaces, you know, I was also in the midst of all that 
um, being a co-founder of Black Benefactors, which is a local giving circle, a Black focused um, giving circle. So um, truly um, the, 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 the philanthropy is a part of my, my work and my, my pleasure. I mean, it's, it's all rolled into one. So I really am grateful that it's become a ministry for me. Terry, go right ahead. Uh, good morning or afternoon, wherever you happen to be um, joining us, uh, to be among you all. Um, I feel as though the conversation definitely will be rich, but um, my journey, uh, again, I am Terry Love, the current chair of Community Investment Network uh, Board of Directors. And initially as a child, I didn't realize what philanthropic giving or foundation realm, like those terms weren't it, but I did have an understanding of decision making. Um, my mother was a scholarship chair um, for an organization and I recognized her work in basically making sure that voices of applications were presented and not just it's written on paper, it must mean this. Um, I know that she had an understanding and it tapped into community and would say, I know this individual, I know this candidate, um, I can see past a typo on an application and recognize the work that they're doing and the needs that they have. And so she was able to make those decisions, be it a small contribution towards their educational endeavors, but just seeing those activities um, as a child, I remember seeing her serve on that up through my applications myself, and then her guidance to make sure that as I was applying the things that I did within those applications to make sure that I conveyed beyond just the piece of paper or just the submission um, was the first realized and most, I guess, um, close proximity to supply side of philanthropy. Um, journey on beyond that, while I was in graduate school, um, I got introduced to Birmingham Change Fund, which is one of the anchor giving circles within Community Investment Network. And it was there that I saw not only people that looked like me that were philanthropists, but literally seeing, hearing, and understanding the movement that is philanthropy and supply side of philanthropy um, throughout the nation. And so tapping in, that's been a journey that's now uh, 13 or 14 years. Um, and so here I am. <laughs> And Dr. Freeman, I'll let you unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm excited to be here as well. Kia, you're doing incredible work in Tennessee. And Terry and the collective givers of CIN are a powerhouse. And Edward and Susan at Abfi are just uh, on the leading edge. And, and Dr. Jackie is, is a philanthropic intellectual hero of mine. So I'm, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I would say, you know, similarly, I grew up in the church. I'm the son, grandson, nephew, and cousin of Baptist preachers and first ladies and um, had that, that experience. And I grew up, you know, watching the, the old folks sway back and forth and sing, you can't beat God giving and other songs like that. And some of them would have their heads bowed and be deep in thought and meditation while they sang. And others would be looking up to the rafters with tears in their eyes and my young mind couldn't grasp, but I knew something was real. And I knew that it moved them to be generous and to give and to invest all they had into the people around them, not just their uh, you know, immediate household. And so that's the tradition that I came out of. And, and one day in particular, when I was a teenager, I'll never forget a, one of the members of my church named Mr. Burns approached me uh, and, and just out of the blue, just put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Tyrone, you could be president of the United States one day if you want to. And he hugged me and then he just walked on and that was it, you know, and that was a powerful philanthropic gift to me, right? Mm -hmm. um, where he was, you know, death and life are in the power of the tongue, right? He was investing in me in my spirit as a young black man, um, you know, in this tumultuous world. And, um, you know, so, and the beauty of that kind of story is it's not about money, right? I mean, our tradition values a whole range of gifts, especially the power of words and the gifts of words. And so um, that's the tradition that produced me like everybody else on this panel. And um, I went to a historically black college, Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, where I was introduced to the idea of T 
teaching as philanthropy because my, my professors, I wasn't just a number. They too invested themselves in me in ways that their syllabus didn't, you know, they didn't have to, right? They went above and beyond the syllabus. And so um, later I entered into professional fundraising and was amazed that this professional space really had no clue about the depth and the beauty of Black philanthropy. And so now I feel privileged to be, um, you know, uh, writing and, and researching and, and, and trying to contribute uh, to the conversation and to the, the tradition um, in a different way. So again, delighted to be here. Yeah, I heard some themes in our conversation. I heard scholarship, spirituality, relationship, and teaching. That seems to be what ties everyone's um, relationship with philanthropy together. But that also, I believe, is what ties us back to um, our ancestral uh, heritage of who we are. Um, Dr. Copeland, would you mind starting us off? And then I'm going to have Dr. Freeman um, kind of pick up from there, talking about the history. Give us some framing around the history of philanthropy um, before even chattel slavery, when we come, you know, when we were kings and queens in uh, our own spaces. Um, and then, Dr. Freeman, I'd love for you to pick it up and really talk about as you have looked at the modeling life of um, Madam C.J. Walker, as one example, share some of the information that, that has come out of that. Thank you, Kia, and you're doing a fantastic job. Um, I, We still, and sometimes I can't believe it, uh, because there's been 30 years of research to document that Black people give. And so you would think at this point, it is just conventional wisdom but having been in the field for a long time now, finding I'm just having these deja vu moments all over again where we have to keep reinforcing that actually there is no society on the planet throughout human history that has not had some structure um, and practices and even cultural principles of giving for mutual support. In the West, Mainstream philanthropy just happens to call it philanthropy. But there are words in every single human language that ex ex um, express this notion of just love and support for one another. But then there are different social structures to facilitate this giving. And so in the US, I mean, philanthropy has no beginning in Africa because it has always just been a part of the fabric. Uh, without getting into all the details, the various religious institutions organize philanthropy uh, in Africa. Um, also, um, the contemporary giving circles in Black communities across the world have their roots in Africa, where I often like to remind people these days um, that those giving circles not only funded what we would call nonprofits, but they funded businesses. They were kind of catch all um, pools of resources, social networks, inspiration, uh, mutual support to simply build the foundational institutions of a strong community. And they came to the US, um, Islamic philanthropy, Christian philanthropy, because Christianity actually started in Africa. Um, the traditional religions of Africa all had principles of um, giving as just an expectation of a, a socially responsible adult gave. Um, the African traditions of giving survived in both structure, but also in concept. Um, many of the scholars who write about our philanthropic traditions talk about the role of the church and our voluntary associations, um, the Underground Railroad itself, and this notion that you create a social group and you give what you have to support the cohesion of your community, the next generation, as well as social progress is as African, American, and African as apple pie and fufu. So um, it's just something we need to teach our children. Um, I do believe that that needs to be part of our philanthropic or just our education of our children. And there's no place children will learn that than in the home because the global stereotype is that black people are the supplicants of the world still. 
that we do not, unlike every other human being on the planet, because we're black, we do not give, we take. And so it is really important now that we're at a sort of historic uh, crossroads where we could either retain and grow the progress we have had or backtrack to the 1950s. And um, that's because of the triple whammy of just out of the, um, out of the closet race, racist backlash against the progress we've made that we see manifest in the lynchings that we experienced as a people, not just in the US, but black children are being shot in the streets in Brazil and in so many places across the world. Also, you know, our communities are most impacted by climate change. And we've seen more intense and ferocious natural disasters um, over the past couple of decades that have brought uh, the reality of um, global warming into the living rooms of black people and many other people across the US and the world. And of course, the COVID ep epidemic is a just case story of the impact of climate change, racism, and unequal access um, to healthcare. So I, this is our San Kofa moment. You know, the Ghanaian people have this notion that you have to look back to move forward. So I'm hoping today that we can talk about how we can retrofit what has worked to keep us alive for millennia in our philanthropic traditions. And from that core, move beyond it and with it to also really just talk about how we get equal access to private capital to rebuild our communities, especially post COVID. It's, it's just about resources in any way we can put them together to support our continuing existence. Yes, um, um, how to improve on that. I, I would just say that, you know, the, the uh, thinking about the origins of, of, of African American philanthropy as a subset of this larger black diaspora philanthropy. You know, um, in 1909, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote that few races are more instinctively philanthropic than the Negro. Um, and he wrote this in a national study on black philanthropy that he did, all right, in 1909. And, and that was the second national study of black philanthropy that he did. Mm -hmm. And so, and he goes back 40 years because uh, he wants to know what have Black people done for themselves after slavery. Um, and he documents this beautiful typography, a robust philanthropic landscape of literary societies, churches, uh, women's clubs, schools that are self-funded, that organically grew out of the community because what do you do when the government is conspiring against you, the private markets are conspiring against you, even our beloved nonprofit sector is complicit in this right not accepting black children in, in, in these in the, in the charities of the day right you, you you turn inward you build your own and and so that is an incredible thing that was happening during that particular period and and that was the context for the story i tell about madam walker and i didn't want to focus on on the millionaire label i wanted to put her back into the community that produced her um, at the washerwomen, the church women, the club women, the, the fraternal women who surrounded her and nurtured her and taught her to, to love her people and her responsibility to give back. It, it, you know, she had to be socialized into that. Uh, she was an orphan, her, so she didn't get to know her parents, right? So these other women served that purpose for her. Um, and, and so when you look at the, the, the environment and the people and the context that produced her, then there's a whole new story that opens up about our generosity. This is why uh, the Black journalist Gertrude Moselle in 1894 called Ida B. Wells the quintessential philanthropist of the race, not because of money, because of what she was doing with her pen and her words to, to speak truth to power about lynching. And so this, this is part of that rich history. Um, and she also said that that went back to Africa, as, as Dr. Jackie just said, right? That, that generosity traveled across the Middle Passage inside Black bodies, right? And, and found a new way to root and express itself um, on those plantations and in, in the free communities. And so there's a direct through line from that period to the, the, the giving circles that are going on 
around today. There's a direct through line mm -hmm. with Black Lives Matter and the anti-lynching movement from that era. Yeah. Um, you know, when you see, you know, Stacey Abrams and all the, that's that's Madam what that's 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 what black women do, right? And and black men do this too. There's a tradition right. in the community, right? So this is really mirroring and this is really our generation's turn to catch that baton and keep it going. And we have these incredible examples from history to to inspire us and inform us not to give up. We know it'll be hard, but we know that we've been here before and we can do this and we can get through it. Yeah, I hope that if you are listening to this moment, this is a master class in Black excellence um, and who we are. So I hope that you're paying attention. I hope that you caught those nuggets. I couldn't write fast enough. I can't wait for the replay to get some of those quotes. But I want to talk about um, what Dr. Freeman, you just mentioned, and Dr. Jack, you mentioned this as well um, uh, in, in various ways, but the cultural principles of giving and how they show up presently. Um, and so I want Edward and Terry to pick up here and talk about the uh, how we've been operating during the pandemic um, as we are, I won't say done with it, but we're on maybe the other side of the, um, uh, of the bell curve here. Um, what innovation what pivots, what priorities are you seeing based on what was just laid out for us, understanding history is present, it's ever present in, in, in cyclical. Um, so what are you seeing, Edward, in the work that you're doing? And then Terry, pick that up with some of the innovative things that you're seeing around youth uh, and young people's involvement. Yeah, no, I was actually ready to give an offering after Reverend um, Copeland and Reverend uh, Freeman did their <laughs> sermons because it just, it, you know, it just warms my heart that, you know, when we hear these stories and we get reminded of really this, this is not new. And that's the part that can't be said enough in this space. And it, it's not new for Black folks and not, not new for the world. And so in the spirit of that, you know, what we do also know to be true is that, uh, you know, we, you know, APA and other organizations have said we're living in a racism pandemic as, as much as we are living in this COVID-19 pandemic. But if we see a, a disaster, a natural disaster that were to happen, like what's happening in Louisiana and the Florida right now, or, or, or tennis, Texas now, um, people want to find ways to respond to natural disasters. But they're often so slow to respond to these human-made disasters like anti-Black racism and like this notion of you know, seeing our folks slaughtered uh, on the streets or in their bedrooms. Um, the idea that we're seeing um, folks feeling an urgency to respond is a wonderful thing, but it's still at the expense of lives that we got folks to understand that racism exists. And so, you know, AFI and, and, and others, we're seeing this huge um, insurgence of funds going in, folks creating black funds and, and creating ways through which to give support. But we know too that organizations that are doing, that have been doing the work since before the COVID-19 pandemic were there making dollars out of 15 cents, if you will. I mean, the idea that folks were making a way out of no way for such a long time and black led, black focused organizations are where we've been really focused on at AFI and, and encouraging folks to understand that when you're doing this work, you need to be, if you wanna be in community, don't go in community with a parachute, tap into the people that are in these communities and find ways through which to give them the supports that they need, not just for a, a, you know, a band-aid, but what's the long-term strategies to this work? And so we're seeing a significant resonance with folks around how are we finding long-term strategies? And literally in the traditional philanthropic sector, if you will, um, folks are really starting to, to, to understand, but we know too that it's gonna require some work. And there's gonna be some ways in which people don't really understand. They see where we are today, but they don't know how we got to today. They don't know how federal, state, and local policies have created the vacuum of access to wealth and, and community growth and the idea of creating opportunities for folks and access to the equitable, equitable um, resources that everyone sees in America, but we know it doesn't make its way to oftentimes our communities and other communities of color. So we've seen folks wanting to pay attention and wanting to learn. There's some eagerness that are, that's coming on, online, but there's always that question is for how long? And the important part of that is that giving circles and other black giving is gonna be around as soon as people start pivoting to some other shiny new penny. And so the idea that we need to keep encouraging and we keep working to encourage people to understand that this is not short-term work. Uh, as we tend to say in our work, when we do work workshops on racial equities that it didn't take, it took us 400 years to get to this point, over 400 years. And so what are we gonna do now? It's not gonna be done in one grant cycle. 
it's not going to be fixed by the next fiscal year. So it's going to require some long-term sustained work. And people are listening to that. And so we need more folks to be on board with that and understanding how we shift, not just the resources, but resources of all types, including policy resources, including access to, to services and goods and, 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 and getting on vendors lists as Black businesses that can provide equal quality support and services to other vendors to make sure that folks are investing in all ways possible. And I know a statement that was always in the spirit of, um, you know, the work and engagement with Community Investment Network was the idea that you can give time, talent, treasure, or testimony. Everybody has something to give. And so we just have to figure out what are those things that we can give in the spirit of that and keep doing so. And doing so, even after we take off our mask, we need to keep doing so. Even we need, we need to be prepared for whatever the next thing is going to be so that it doesn't become something that we're caught, you know, kind of off guard because we know it's going to always be something. There's always something waiting to impact and harm us. And we just have to always be prepared. As they say, you know, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So the idea of how that shows up for us as a people and those that are allies that want to support us becomes how we win and how we continue to win. That's Terry. Yeah, in my, in my anti-racism and justice work, I often ask people to think about a guiding question. And so, Edward, you gave us one of those guiding questions which was about, will I invest in black humanity like I do natural disasters? So I really appreciate that question because I think that's how we um, uh, keep going in this work. So I appreciate, I wanted to pause there. Terry, pick us up from there. So you posed a question that um, I'm gonna have to like go unpack um, <laughs> a lot later, but um, just to bring back up um, what uh, he was pointing out in, the collective use of voice. Um, I think Dr. Copeland pointed this out at the very beginning, um, time, talent, treasure. Uh, in CIM, we use a lot, utilize the term testimony, but utilize, utilization of voice, um, specifically in response to uh, COVID-19 and, and again, the terminology of when the mask is removed um, and then this side of the bell curve, we do realize that there is a lot of work that has to be done in terms of equity and in terms of the work that we are doing and have been doing that is just now getting the attention that in other spaces has already, it, it's been being done, but it's just now having the light that's being brought to it. And I say that in response to, um, I know CIN and many bargaining circles in that moment uh, being faced with a global pandemic, look and realize, okay, this is what is going on in our space. This is what's going on within our communities. And we realize that the attention and the voice that needs to be said loudly is not going to be said unless someone says it or someone does something about it. So examples are um, our giving circles took that time and took that initiative to literally reinvest in our communities about the things that we were able to identify. Um, our network, uh, just examples um, in Denver, um, got together and provided a real need requirements for their community and in which case brought and catalyzed other community partners to that because identification of people in need was something that uh, community foundations were not having access to in that moment. Um, so utilization of our giving circle who knew and could identify and point out to who those uh, populations were. Um, in Phoenix, the same case. Um, in Birmingham, offering and opening up spaces in which to educate people about what is happening with COVID-19. It is a novel concept and we do not know what it means, what it means for you, but come learn and see what this could mean, what it could mean for you and how to prevent and how to actually keep yourself safe from. Um, so that begin, again becomes a, it wasn't a dollar investment. It wasn't a come and put hands on and lift investment, but it truly was a utilization of voice utilization of space and those network ties. Um, and so when you look at now the aftermath of COVID-19 or the other side of the bell curve, um, what has that voice done for institutional or philanthropic giving? Um, we literally went in and disrupted and said, you have a funding model in place currently that only gives to nonprofits doing work that fits a certain checklist of criteria that aligns with a certain goal that you have for this year because that was what your funding strategy was. That's not gonna work because global pandemics can happen. And if it does, what do you do and what do you shift and how do you pivot to make sure that those people that are literally the least 
access or have least access or least observed are not left out because they're the ones that are the most vulnerable. So here's an opportunity for you to see how we, donor advised fund holders, are telling you to utilize the funds that we've invested into your foundation. And this is how we want this done. So you now, as an institution, have to recognize that we are the ones that are willing to partner with you to connect you with community. But if you're not doing it in the way in which we see the needs to be able to be met, then we're going to have to look at this a different way. And that community foundation may not be our source for funding partners anymore. We may end up having another institution that we partner with, or we may move our funds to another institution that is doing the work that we want to see done in our community. And so that has been a disruption um, of, oh, we see the importance of doing the work that you have brought attention to us. And then also um, your voice in the decision of the funds outside of your own within our community. Um, so, or excuse me, within uh, your fund. So uh, Giving Circle in Denver um, made a social justice grant last year. Um, and from the attention from that, the decision was we have a larger initiative from the community foundation here and we want you to be a part of that conversation as to how we address this issue of social justice and social equity and making that change and your voice is going to be a lot more uh carry a lot more weight um as you are a part of this collective in, in terms of black giving um so you have that vein of or excuse me that tap into the veins of black community and minority community, if we don't have access to that, we're not going to be able to make the social change that we wish to see here in that space. So um, I know that, again, you brought up that last question and I'm like, I want to like go into like a whole like webinar series on that. <laughs> yeah, well, listen, I'm, I'm going to advocate for a part two here, right? Um, but, but, but that really is like just a more of a guiding, internal guiding question as well for us to think about. Uh, particularly for those who are on the line who are um, trying to understand how to support giving circles um, or those who are looking to launch giving circles, you know, thinking about how, um, as Edward was mentioning, how urgent we run towards nat natural disasters, not realizing that racism has created us as a natural disaster um, as well, and we need that support. Um, I want to see if there are any questions in the chat because we're nearing our time, which I don't like, um, because this conversation just got warm. Uh, it's kind of like that part of church where you know it's the first offering and you know you have a couple more uh, coming. And so you don't want to leave, but you also need to get someplace. So if there are questions, please either put them in the chat um, or put them in the Q&A and I'll get to them. Um, if there are any questions, I'm going to lead to our last couple um, of questions here, but I'll keep looking my eye at the chat. Um, I want to go back to something. Um, this is thinking going forward because I think everybody has now kind of pushed us towards what happens next. Um, what happens when we come unmasked? I like the way Edward mentioned that. Um, Dr. Copeland mentioned the word retrofit. So I'm gonna use that here. How do we um, retrofit what we know? So that's that history we started with. Again, we know it's cyclical, but starting with it's always been ever present as a part of our, our, our DNA and our culture and understanding. Um, how do we retrofit what we know, um, what we're currently doing for what's next? And I'll let anybody pick up and answer that question. How do we push forward um, so that we can finally start to address some of the areas or the areas that have already been addressed that we use them again and we don't abandon those. Um, Terry, I see you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Um, I only did that because I think you actually asked part of that question and I didn't get a chance to answer it. So I actually want to just weigh in. Um, so I, I bring forth um, a giving circle that birthed out of one in Arizona called C. It's Students Engaged in Ethical Decisions. Um, and I say that because they have had the opportunity to see the work of literally their fathers or other community leaders in their area, see the work that they're doing and recognize the impact that's being made, made the decision themselves to say, we do not have the same financial capital, but we do have labor and hand equity that we can give in our decision making and doing in this community and know that we want to make an impact for those people that are around us. So looking at what happened before, you know, looking at and seeing their fathers, their other community leaders, and seeing the work that was done there, recognizing the work that they could do, and then actually taking the time to dialogue with us to find out, this is the idea that we have. How do we make this something that can be done for the future? Um, and then making us break down 
what even we have started to erect is structures of what Black philanthropy is or what philanthropy is or what you need to do in order to be a philanthropist. Um, even though we have a broader lens and say you can do time, talent, treasure, testimony, um, what does it mean to be a college student that wants to give an ethical and real gift to your community? And it's something that blows my mind when they come back and say, oh yeah, we wanted to help with the community garden that's in place. And my mind says, that's tapping into your desire to create healthy communities and address childhood obesity. That's something that even for me was a wake up and awakening, even though I thought I'm enlightened and tapped into this work. Um, and it points to the fact that we have to embrace those that come to this conversation and to this space, and then also recognize that we ourselves bring some bias into saying what is right or what should be done or how we should go about this work but we leave room for the potential for growth for that. So I would say that's how shaping what has happened is currently happening and then being open and receptive to what needs to happen in the future for these spaces that like um, Edward said, are gonna be here beyond the movement, beyond the mass culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, it's just youth throughout our history have been sometimes the overlooked innovators in our community. And so it's just really inspiring to, to hear about those innovations, Terry. Um, I would say that kind of looking forward and going back to the roots, I think of maybe four things that I'll try and go through real quick. I think we need to remember that the root word of philanthropy is love and it includes love of black people and true love of self and promoting just the whole notion of our humanity uh, and that sounds, you know, maybe on the face of it as unnecessary, but we're living in this moment where hatred of Black people is, is coming out of the closet and morphing into public policy, um, the lynchings <laughs> that we are all suffering through. And so it is, um, it's just really important to remember the root. And yes, we use various tools, we use money, we use our voice, et cetera, but we all need to behave in our homes and in broader society with um, a cloak of self-love that emanates out to the rest of humanity. For me, increasingly black philanthropy is about love of self and uh, humanity and the planet we share. I also think that, um, you know, one of the sort of dominant mainstream kind of implicit frameworks of philanthropy is that there are these hard and fast lines between philanthropy, philanthropic giving, especially in the US, and then um, providing services and supporting businesses. But if you look at the world in general and the global movement of Black giving, and let's just say funding equity and economic justice, those lines are much more porous. And we really are in a period now given, I just read somewhere that 60% of small to medium sized Black businesses in the US have had to close due to COVID. And they hire along with government, a majority of our people. So we do need almost like a Marshall Plan type strategy to rebuild our communities because we have lost so much ground. Um, and so um, I do think getting more informed and sophisticated about um, new sources of funding that are not strictly philanthropy like impact investment. There is a 50 trillion, that's with a T, impact investing market. And Black people, Black philanthropists, communities, businesses generally are not accessing it. And so that's going to be one of the focus areas of the Women Invested to Save Earth Fund is to just make sure our communities are fully educated about what it is, how you access it, so that we can have fine-tuned advocacy to ensure that we're getting our part of the impact investing pie that grows about 
a year and um, actually far surpasses philanthropy. So we are gonna need to access these new forms of capital emerging. I think we always talk about the African roots of philanthropy, but sometimes we're, we are not fully inclusive of the diversity within the diversity of black of the black community and our philanthropy and our social action work. Um, and, and when we are inclusive, it's more of a one-off initiative or it happens around Kwanzaa or um, sometimes Black History Month. But I have found it just, not just enriching, but completely transformative to learn how Black immigrants come to the US with not even a green card and end up amassing enough capital, as I saw when I was living in Minneapolis, to build a mall. And you've already been, only been in the country for <laughs> two years. And that's all about how they do their giving circles to support community projects and businesses, because they know if we have powerful entrepreneurs and community advocates, it will lift all boats in a country that's not always working for us, but against us. So I encourage us to develop real ties and to join Black Philanthropy Month, frankly, because we um, were recognized by the UN as an important annual holiday, not holiday, but commemoration of um, Black giving traditions. And also now 80 countries are involved in Brazil, Canada, um, the entire African continent uh, and the Caribbean will be um, organizing and celebrating their own Black Philanthropy Month summits, like a United Nations of Black giving and funding equity. I think there are certain megatrends happening that are severely impacting the Black community. And I would hope that our philanthropy and funding equity efforts would address the fact that there are new forms of discrimination, such as artificial intelligence and facial recognition software that are fundamentally disadvantaging our communities everywhere in um, the criminal justice system, access to education and jobs. And it's just really important that a tech justice agenda is, is somewhere on the radar screen for our, um, our community because it's the new invisible hand of the market. And we will wake up one day and find out that, yeah, I, I wanted to be a, a, was making good money in trucking, but now they're only self-driving trucks. And these innovations have been sort of in play for decades and they are about to culminate in seismic shifts that have been really accelerated by COVID where we all had to depend on these virtual tools. But there's a lot of opportunity also to raise more money, more capital for our community, our nonprofits and businesses address climate change, healthcare disparities, if we can figure out how to use tech for good. So let's support our black technologists trying to sort of move this brave new world to support um, black communities. Um, you know, this is black philanthropy month, so I'm thinking about this a lot. Um, so, but those are sort of four principles that I would suggest for these times that would help us convert the power of our heritage and our just collective giving uh, to address the specific challenges shaping a black future today. As um, an example of some of that self-love, I think it's important moving forward that we tend to and invest in black mental health and healing. Uh, yeah. We've all been traumatized um, and the trauma is compounded with each new killing and each new video. And it's even compounded with, with the various DNI initiatives that are popping up in our workplaces and, and how those are playing out and how they may disproportionately fall back to 
uh, the very people it's supposed to help, uh, you know, engage. And so I think it's important, you know, here, I'm, you know, I'm reminded too that history teaches us this, right? In many ways, Madam Walker worked herself into an early grave because of this nonstop, yes. right? And, and also we know about weathering, right? The, the, the medical right. science has, has documented that racism impacts the body at the cellular level. Right. And, and people like Resma Menachem and my grandmother's hand, all these books and, and discussion about black trauma and understanding. I think it's important. Um, you know, um, uh, there, there's a, a, a picture of Rosa Parks practicing yoga that Dr. Stephanie Evans found from oh. Georgia State. That's very important. So we've got to take care of ourselves, especially coming out of this moment and dealing with the work coming uh, ahead. Um, and just an, an echo of that, I, I also think, you know, again, uh, to, to Dr. Jackie's point, you know, philanthropy only provides about 12% of all the revenues that go into the nonprofit sector, right? And so um, I think this is where earlier Terry mentioned policy. I think policy is important too, right? Um, the assault on, on voting rights going on pretty much in every state house right now. Um, there, there's a lot of things that need to be tended to and so the philanthropic and the political, I mean, those things have always been meshed for us. We haven't had the pleasure or the 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 you know be able to afford to think in compartmentalized ways. It's all hands on deck, and so part of it is 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 the ongoing activism uh, to deal with the policy aspects of this as well too that I think are very important. And I, I would say, oh, I'm sorry, am I okay? Oh, um, I, I just had to put um, Ms. Viola Fletcher name in the chat. Uh, if no one has seen the, the, the hearings uh, on Capitol Hill regarding the Greenwood Massacre, and to see a 107-year-old woman, a 106-year-old man, and another other um, century-old people tell their story of what they witnessed, the Black, the black lives that did not matter in Tulsa, Greenwood a hundred years ago this um, this coming um, month that is the the, the, the the think that they have lived this long to tell that story in hopes to receive some sort of restitution for that injustice not for them because they won't we don't know how long they'll be here but it'll be for other people for them to have stayed and been able to give that had a hundred years before they can tell that story on the public stage is a reminder for us of how important this is for a long haul strategy. We cannot dismiss the fact that black lives have not mattered for a very, very long time in this country. We cannot dismiss the fact that there have been policies that have been put in place to deny us access to, to equitable resources. And we can celebrate those that have been able to, to get over the hump and do all those things and be charitable and give back. But the idea to, to you know, Jackie's point around the idea of the Sankofa, we should, we got to always be in the spirit of looking back so we move forward. And so mm -hmm. in the spirit of that, we know that there's a whole bunch that we could have learned, we can learn from people like Ms. Fletcher and others that are have been on this earth that have written books or that books have been written about thanks to people like uh, Dr. McKinley that have been able to tell us stories and strategies around how we really get over and not just get over, but actually thrive in this space because we know all too often there's always someone there that does not want us to do well and does not want well for us. And so coalescing and, and building community through this community giving and community volunteering, mutual aid that folks have been doing forever that continues to be an important part to help get people over the hump when they couldn't make it to the, the giving um, center that was set up in this heart of the city. And we got folks that are living in rural communities, black folks in rural communities that can't get access, or even in the city, they can't get access when the systems are shut down. We got to really be strategic and unified in this work. Hopefully the, the, the um, Black Philanthropy Month will be another time for us to remember where we are. But every month that we have, we cannot, we just cannot just work in one month. It cannot be Black History Month where we learn Black history. It cannot be Black Music Month where we learn Black music. It's got to be all months, all the time, 24 7, 365, that we have to focus and commit and bring other people with us from other spaces. They don't have to look like us to be for us. And, but we have to remember the fact that there's a whole bunch of people that are not for us that we need to make sure we get called out. We call them out in the public spaces. We call them out in Congress. We call them out in the White House when it's needed. But we got to speak truth to power in order for us to overcome and be beyond where our ancestors were. Yes, indeed. I have so many notes. Um, and I hope that you all go back. We are 
actually a little bit over time. Um, but I want us to go back and think about those themes that I mentioned at the top, and this was their content. I just um, want to memorialize it. Um, the themes of the conversation for today were scholarship, spirituality, relationship, and teaching. That came up in this entire conversation all the way through. Um, and it is uh, uh, history, it is present, it is future. All of those things we've always done and carried with us. I heard some really amazing um, quotes. I won't get the whole quote right, but the generosity traveled in the bodies of our ancestors across the Middle Passage. I'm going to keep that one. That's, I'm carrying that one. The root word of philanthropy is love, Black love in particular. Um, and, and I got so many uh, notes. Uh, going every which way, but I want you all to take this conversation back to your communities. If you are a uh, person who's leading a giving circle, let them watch this video because I believe this is an opportunity for us to learn our history. When we don't know our history, then we are bound to repeat um, some of those things like what Edward was just mentioning, um, where people don't expect for us to live long enough to tell a story. And we now have the opportunity to memorialize the stories in a much different way. That's why we record these Zooms. That's why um, Dr. Freeman has written uh, his book. That's why Dr. Copeland has authored many things. That's why Terry and Edward are you know, constantly writing or recording. I went and looked and saw things that are out in the world because if we don't memorialize it, we'll revise the history to make us always be the ones um, taking and never the ones giving. And what we know is that our frequency in giving is high higher than our counterparts, actually. The amount we give may be different, but the frequency we give is high. Um, I have a note here I want to make sure. A couple of things. One, make sure you uh, save the chat. If you don't know how, if you're on your computer, those three little dots at the bottom uh, beside where you see panelists and attendees, you can grab that and click Save Chat because there are lots of resources there. Um, ABSE has the 50th year um, anniversary this year. Um, I know that Dr. Copeland and her team over Black Philanthropy Month is in August. Um, in Nashville, we actually celebrate the entire month, but we also have gotten a day deemed as Black Philanthropy Day because of Dr. Copeland's work, um, and so that's really excellent. Thank you for joining this. Please com uh, uh, complete a brief survey. It's in the uh, it's an evaluation. It's in the chat for you. We can put it there again, and then make sure you continue the conversation. It doesn't have to end here. We give some. It also continues this evening at 6 p.m. with how to build a first impression toolkit, so that's going to give you some tangibles with Iliasa. I'm going to pass it back over, I believe, to Ilyasa uh, just for a moment to take us out, um, or we can end here. But I want to make sure I honor uh, our host for today and let her have any final words. Yes, thank you, Kia. And thank you to all of our panels. This has really been an incredible discussion. And we're, you know, we we need to see how we can keep this conversation going and have, have another one of these. Let's talk. But um, thank you all so much. And um, as Kia said, please take the post-session evaluation that is uh, in the chat. And we're going to leave some time for everyone to open up these links. Make sure you save the chat. Um, and we're going to um, bring up some slides and have some music to close this out. Thank you.